Welcome to Health Stealth Radio, where we move away from the mundane to gather insights from the shadows, from the shadows of enterprise and patient cybersecurity. Yes, we surely believe that traditional themes like endpoint software and zero trust are critical, but given massive advances in AI, remote and wearable device hacking, and data hostage negotiators, there's a much darker side to cybersecurity, and not everyone is quite willing to talk about it in public. Health Stealth Radio will thrive on these topics and encourage fireside spats to debate them. Here's your host, Frank Katita. Welcome to this special edition of Health Stealth Radio, live from Vive 2024 in the City of Angels. I'm your host, Frank Katita, and what a treat we have for you today. I'm in the company of this force of nature, Dr. Tina Shaw, aka Tina the Great, and you'll soon learn why she has this tag. Tina is a practicing physician and national expert in workforce well-being, public policy, and healthcare technology. In 2022, she was handpicked by the Surgeon General to serve as senior advisor and created the nation's first strategy to address worker burnout and the great resignation in healthcare. She also served in both the Obama and Trump White House administrations with a dual appointment at the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Among her work at the VA, she was the first National Director of Clinical Well-Being, and she's most proud of expanding veteran access to primary care by optimizing electronic medical record-based workflows. Tina is now Chief Medical Advisor for a Bridge, a cutting-edge AI well-being platform. First of all, I think it's, it's just a, a great opportunity for us to connect again. Um, and I, you know, I've had the great opportunity to watch your rapid career trajectory. Uh, dating back to uh, the times that we were doing and you were chairing uh, burnout conferences and, and, and your work with the Surgeon General's office. Uh, before we get into the, the bridge technology and, and AI and all that stuff, from a personal branding point of view, can you tell me a little bit about the journey of how you got to where you were, from where you were, to where you are now? Because it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Frank, um, you know some of the story, so I will try and add a couple of spicy details. Our, our, our audience doesn't. That's okay. Here's the bottom line. I was marching along the path, the typical path of a doctor, and then I had this feeling, and I didn't quite know what it was at that time, but four years into my medical training, I was a pulmonary and critical care fellow. I had this very... Uh, very specific thought pop up and it was I'm leaving medicine I can't stay in I need to get out I have student loans I know I need to make money but I can't do it as a doctor so I was not really sure why I felt that way it turns out I was burned out and it was because despite working with good people I was in a toxic workplace as in the demands were more than I could actually fulfill as an individual but um I've now been working on burnout for over a decade because of what happened to me. And I just, I just think, what a cool profession we're in as physicians or as clinicians. But unfortunately, more than 50% of folks, and I'm quoting some statistics from the world of, uh, of physicians, in some data we're showing 63% of doctors are burnt out. So um, when I wrapped my training, and thankfully I became a pulmonary and critical care doc, I stayed in my, my clinical fellowship, I then took a pretty crazy step, which was I became a White House fellow. And what that is, is the nation's leading public service program, and it's for mid-career professionals. So I had a dual appointment in the Obama White House and the Trump White House, and the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, where I became VA's first director of clinician well-being. And that opened my eyes up. In fact, I drank the tech Kool-Aid. That's when it first happened, Frank. You hear it first. <laughs> I remember doing this one project, and this was about reducing in-basket messages in primary care. And, and this is why I drank the Kool-Aid, because in three months, we were able to save about an hour and a half of clinician time by getting rid of low-value alerts, their equivalent of in-basket messages. And that allowed VA to see 18,000 more vets a week in primary care. Yeah. So I was just thinking, wow, okay, I believe that doctors and nurses are elite athletes. So are case managers and PT and OT. They train and train. We put them on a track, but we also sort of make it hard for them to run the race. And we're surprised that they can't run that fast. And what, what would it take to take the shackles off so they could run really fast? So the VA was sort of ahead of the curve in that, in that regard, right? Because we always have a stereotype of that, you know, it's just, I mean, it's just bureaucracy. It's burden. 
with, with so many other things, funding and everything. So, so they took the lead. Yeah, that's right. Um, and actually, at that time, VA had lower burnout rates than the average health system in the private sector. Yeah, it really laid the foundation for me. And after that, I really started thinking, you know what feels good in my heart? It's working on burnout, but thinking about how to leverage tech for burnout. So it then pulled me to a health system called Wellstar, which is based in Georgia. I eventually became the acting CMIO during the pandemic. And this was walk in the walk, right? So as we were implementing virtual care, how do you do it in a way that minimizes burnout and cognitive load on clinicians? Oh my gosh. Okay. okay. I mean, we, we got a two hour segment here, right? Okay, <laughs> on yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Maybe we don't know. We totally could. Um, bring me back if you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it will be part two, act two. Love it. Okay, here's the thing doctors just want need to know. So if you give them a five page tip sheet, you know exactly where that's going. It's going in the garbage. So what we did was we came up with a three by three grid and it literally said, here's the type of virtual visit. Is it telephone? Is it you know an asynchronous message or is it a video visit? Here are the three things you have to put in your note. And here's the one code you have to drop. And on the back end, we you know we sort of automated switching for whichever payer it was. But we can't give doctors more clerical work. We need to give them simple things because the work they're doing is already so complicated. So that was it. It was practicing how do you how do you on the back end get revenue cycle together with IT, with compliance, with coding to kind of negotiate this before it even hits a doctor. So I, I'm sort of curious with all the attention on wellness and burnout, uh, are we seeing any progress really being made on the whole? Or, or I mean, is this one of those things where uh, the realization and acceptance of, of the problem actually increases the appearance of the number of victims we have out there. I mean, there was this long period and there continues to be a period of silence. I just, I can't have that fingerprint on my record. Otherwise, I'll never get a job again. Uh, is, that, is that dynamic changing? I think the stigma is starting to shift, yeah. as in we're starting to address it. There's been considerable work by foundations, including the Dr. Lorna Breen Foundation, that's trying to destigmatize accessing mental health. I mean, if, if I had an ankle and I broke my ankle, like no one would tell me to just walk it off, right? And the same should be thought about with mental health care, which is closely related to burnout, although separate, separate entity. We're still struggling though. I think a lot of folks, and it might be generational, depending on how, how long you've been in the profession, you may not be able to speak in terms of, I feel burnt out and say it openly. Mm -hmm. So we have this challenge, but then we have proxies. We, we see people's intent to leave. We see people reducing clinical hours. And those are really good measures of exactly how bad burnout is. We're still in, we're still in um, the middle of the disaster, right? So w while the pandemic's burden is not as heavy, we have people that have worked so hard that their reserves are drawn. And it's even more, it's even more apparent, at least for me on the front lines. Um, I work part-time as a pulmonary and critical care doc and my colleagues, I'm watching them and working full time, dealing with all the paperwork they have to deal with in addition to a crashing patient. They're like hanging on by a thread in some respects, doing amazing medicine, but they're really being set up for, you know, for hardship. So you have technology now yeah. that's helping to alleviate that problem. The, the global branding guy that I am is, 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 is a student of what's being called AI washing. That every it's just like greenwashing used to be, where everything has to be sustainable. Everything has to have AI, regardless of what the product is. What I mean, you just got a, a very impressive round of funding. So, so there are yeah. there are believers out there. God bless you. So, what is it that's making a bridge different? And and people are saying this isn't just another AI washing product. This is the first time I've seen a company, and I'm I'm just feeling privileged to be part of it, but. At the helm of the company is the highest level of scientific expertise alongside the highest level of clinical expertise. So if you really look at others in the space of Gen AI, they may have one or the other, but we're publishing scientific papers and have the most number of papers published on transformers in healthcare. And this year we launched a bridge research center. We're gonna be doing the same on the clinical side. But you know, when it gets down to it, our CEO still rounds. In fact, yeah, he's finally on a flight to come to Chime because he was on service over the weekend. Wow. I'm still working in the hospital. And I think having that constant pulse as being users really helps. The second thing is we own our entire tech stack. So 
I think if you're not beholden to these large power tools, you have the ability to iterate very quickly and to handle the fact that medicine is moving at a light speed's pace, right? Every other day, there's a new biologic that's announced. So from, from just incorporating brand new names and brand new procedures to being able to accommodate what clinicians actually need, I think that's a differentiator. Is, is there a data set that you're capturing that's, that's a little bit different? I mean, do you see the metrics different? We are founded on a healthcare data set, and I think that's important too, because if you use some of these larger... As opposed, L- as opposed to horizontal with uh, other industries? That's right. So, you know, some of these... So if you think about ChatGPT, for example, right. that is that is a data set that's ingested everything from the web, not just healthcare pertinent data. So it has... It, it's a known fact that it may not be as good as a healthcare data set that's really focused, right? There may be some misinformation included in that. So I think that's, that is one of the things um, that really kind of sets us apart. But we're starting to see some really cool data. In yeah. fact, we're actually now using validated tools to measure burnout and to measure cognitive load, to measure time saved. And we're even starting to get into, well, what's the revenue impact? How much better is billing and, and coding because of this, tech, this tool? And our early results are really promising. Really? Yes. That's fascinating to hear. Yeah. That's fascinating to hear. Um, do you feel that your, your prospects go through, I, I think you might have mentioned it with the generational word. Uh, I, I wrote an article called The Skepticism Maturity Model. So could you tell me a little bit about when you talk to customers you might be in with your, your business development folks and stuff like that, what do you see generationally? Uh, you know, I see skepticism maturity model being Marcus Welby, like you know, 80% of it is intuition, 20% of it is technology, and then the Young Turks, which is 20% technology, 80, 20% intuitive, and 80% because they didn't have the intuitive part yet. What, what, what do you see in terms of convincing people that, that this is going to produce the ROI or return on outcomes? There's something very special when you're a physician, you're experiencing the hardship of taking care of patients on the front lines, and then you're talking about your experience with the technology. I think being able to, to give that credibility is a big, big door opener. But I think the biggest thing is that when people experience a technology for the first time, you sort of see this sense of delight. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know, I don't want to toot our own horn. That's not what I'm no, trying to you do. you should, you should. But not only are we and, and it's so funny, sometimes we have these demos where we end up prescribing crazy things like a brain transplant, you know, when someone starts off with shortness of breath. <laughs> it's, all for, it's all for fun. Shot but, factor, sure. Right, but it's, it's a purpose of helping people understand how, to, how the technology works, right? So they, they see the output of the note which comes within, you know, a very short period of time. Right. Usually our turnarounds less than a minute. But we have the second piece too, and it's instant auditability. So let's say you're looking at the SOAP note that was drafted by a bridge. You can highlight any part of the text and it immediately pulls up where it was, where it came from in the transcript. So I'm, I'm an AI skeptic. I'm not a machine learning engineer, but that would convince me because I know exactly where these words are coming from. That's interesting. So, so you know me well enough and, and I'm totally obsessed with the patient, the, the other patient that clinicians are taking care of. Uh, I'm curious about your perspective on the relationship between clinical burnout and patient mental health. Uh, during my 100-day stay, I, I, I was, did a lot of writing and became aware of what was going on around me. And I, I, I used to call it a, a, what, what was a loneliness palooza between myself and the people that were taking care of me. I mean, there were just... I was incredibly lonely because I was holed up 23 hours a day without seeing people. Uh, th- just during the worst of times, obviously. Uh, and my clinicians would come in and find out that I was running, writing about loneliness about myself. And they said, well, you got to suck it up. You know, do you know how lonely I am? So uh, could, could you tell me about what you see as the intersection of the real patients as opposed to the clinical? Wow. Uh, you're triggering a lot in my head because I, I think I've been the doctor on the other side. And yeah. it's so ironic that both, cl- both patient and, and clinician are experiencing the same symptoms. Yeah. That, it, that just further attests to we've designed our healthcare system to break relationships, not strengthen it. It, it also sort of forces the patient in a way that if you're any way empathetic, that you feel like you have to treat your caretaker. Like, what can I do for you? to make me less lonely, to make it easier for you to be lonely. 
yeah. or less lonely. Yes, that's right. I mean, and what we want is patients to focus on their health. We don't want them to be worrying about their clinician. But, you know, there was a really interesting thing VA did a little a few years ago where they journey mapped the experience of a patient going through a primary care clinic. And they did the same for a clinician. And they found that most of the time the pain points were identical. Yeah. So we know, we know now that the patient and clinician's experience are so closely connected that we should be approaching any intervention as how do we, how do we address both? If we only focus on patient experience and let's say, you know, ask nurses or doctors to do more things without giving them resources, we're going to fail. And if we only focus on clinician experience, we may miss a right, crucial like part. Only clapping with one hand. That's right. So, so this is what's really interesting about a bridge. A bridge gets it. In fact, the first technology we built was to summarize medical conversations for patients so that a patient could just be present with their with Like their scribe, care scribed and through any form that it's entered in, the conversation? So it would listen just like it does now for, for Quite doctors. Quite literally listening, yeah. It would listen and it would generate a transcript that was really called down to the medical parts of the conversation. So if we had talked about the Super Bowl or Taylor Swift, it would have taken, taken that out. out. Yeah. And that's sort of when we went from patient to clinician. But by the way, that patient app is being used by several hundred thousand people. It's a, we consider it a public good. It's actually available on the App Store. So the, the patients are actually using it outside of the facility? Yeah, that's right. So pa- there is a patient-facing app we have. Um, it's not the same technology exactly, but it does a really good job of trying to summarize what happened in the visit. And I think all of that is going back to what you said about loneliness technology and all these other things in healthcare have literally isolated you from your care team, right? Right. And vice versa. So technology like this is intended to get the obstacles out of the way and allow us to look in each other's eyes. Right. And and yet at the same time, not sort of remove some of the sentient aspects of technology. I mean, I mean, that's the hardest thing, as we all know, with AI. That it, I mean, it doesn't have a soul yet, anyway. Right. So how do we how do we how do we get what we need strictly from a healthcare point of view, and yet keep some of the emotional stuff in there that's really part of of the care of the care? Well, so interestingly, we're starting to see that this technology is helping um, patients build trust in their clinicians. We we don't have a formal study uh, out yet. We've designed one. We're hopefully going to kick that off soon, but. This is the first time, and, and I'm talking about medical note summarization, not clinical decision making, because right. I feel like that's a yeah, whole yeah, different that's, category. Yeah, yeah, that's a scary part. But can you imagine going to a doctor's office and actually feeling like you trust your doctor more? I mean, this kind of makes sense because they're going to be listening to you, right? They're not going to be distracted typing on the computer. There's something there. Uh, it makes me very optimistic, and I only wish we had this when you know when you dealt with your crazy ordeal of kind of experiencing healthcare. What, what would have your experience been like? Yeah, and if I got rid of a lot of it, I wouldn't have the great content that I have right now <laughs> to, right. To, be, to be able to talk about. I mean, I, I, you know, I thought it was interesting um, that the um, some of the most important things in my record, my re- medical record, nobody read because they were written sort of in Shakespearean fashion at the end of it. So I couldn't get ice chips. For, for weeks when I was approved to get ice chips. For oh, me, wow. that was the biggest thing in the world. It's a huge thing. It was thing. the biggest thing in the world. It was oh, an yeah. ice chip because I had no water intake at all for, for, for weeks. So, um, you know, finally, you know, battling and battling uh, those kinds of things. And the interoperability parts of it were, were, were just amazing. So, yeah, th- those kinds of things are sort of crazy that people do their jobs. And, um, you know, you, you just, the problem is when, when sick people are really sick, they, they can't give their patient satisfaction score at the moment. This is one of my biggest beefs. You'll see me writing about it and speaking sure. about it. Uh, like when you're in the Uber, they're already asking you for how the ride's going. You know, at the moment, it's just momental, I think it's called, uh, or what I'm terming it. So that's that's sort of what I'm looking for, because everything is retrospective. You know, it's, it's a Prescani survey or... Uh, you know, one of the other survey firms that do it. And, and that, you know, 100 days in day one is a long, long time ago and a lot of different experiences. So I, I, I want to make sure I stay sensitive to your time. Um, what do you think are, are some... We're all in the really high-tech business and you're like out there on steroids. Uh, what, what, given all the years that you've done wellness things, are some of the, the lowest tech things that you can do? 
so when it comes to burnout, you to, mean? Yeah, to bur- burnout and wellness in general, especially burnout. Like, you know, everybody says, well, you got to do this. You got to take care of the scribing stuff. You got to, you know, the, the, the record keeping. I mean, what, what are people doing just to make people happier without technology? I just love your question, Frank, because I think embedded in that is that tech is not going to solve our decades long problems that have gotten us to this point where more than half the workforce. Of which it created in many cases. Oh, yes, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So I do think there's a role for tech. And obviously, you know, working for a bridge as chief clinical officer, I, I am completely bought in because I've experienced it myself with what the tech can do. But you know what? If we were to go back to basics, the first thing would be getting rid of stupid stuff. And I wish I had coined that term, gross, but it came off of a paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine where they literally did, and I think it might have even been a survey monkey, leadership at a health system in Hawaii sent out a survey that said, you know, what's, what is essentially stupid and what, you know, how would we fix it? And they basically got all sorts of feedback to the gist of, this is, I'm, I'm being asked to document this thing, but it's not relevant for my role or it's not relevant for the patient. Maybe being asked something, you know, about dentures when you're, when you have a pediatric patient, right? Something completely irrelevant. And what they did systematically was sort of take all the feedback of what should be fixed because it's low value or no value. And then they started creating a traffic light report. Yeah, so anything that they could fix right off the bat, they would fix it and they would report it on an internal dashboard and make it green. Anything that was in process, they made it yellow. Anything they couldn't do, they would actually give feedback as to why, like, no, we're unable to increase salaries at this time. I think those basics are huge. And they're not that hard in many cases. They're, I mean, they're so ridiculously simple. Yeah. That that uh, yeah that that I mean that those are, those are great points. So I I, I want to keep uh, it fair on time here. Um, you know, you've gone through your own burnout. That's what sort of got you into this. I, I, I'm just curious. I, I ask all of my interviewees, uh, you know, what do you do personally to establish this work life balance of your own? How do you how do you how do you get away with it? I mean, you're in medicine. Thank you for joining you're us now today. In, venture capital in the shadows. Bank. Business. For this episode of about Health stress, Stealth right. Radio, I have two intense jobs. I actually didn't Kikita. know that there could exactly. be something you like more program, intense in the ICU. Please be exactly. sure exactly. to share you your comments on our social like media really sites or feel free what, to contact us with suggestions for new stealthy show themes. We look like forward to welcoming you again for our next broadcast. In the meantime, stay safe out there. Exactly. But it sets me up for the day. So a piece is saying, who's the most important? Out of all, all, out of all the things I have to do, what's the most important? It's taking care of myself. So thinking about working out, sleeping, nutrition, those are probably the bigs. But I'm also going through this exercise nearly every week, that, which says burnout is caused by when the job demands outweigh the job resources. And I look at my, ca- with my calendar, I think about, do I have enough resources to do the jobs I said I would do? And if not, What do I need to do to shift that balance? And that's an employer issue as well. Right. It's a self issue because we tend to be perfectionists in healthcare, but it's also an employer issue. And um, what I love, at least about where I work, is that we have the entire leadership open to considering what would it mean to be a truly employee well-being focused company. But in lieu of that, there's so much you can do as an individual. And this is sort of recognizing that you've kind of exhausted what your human human capacity is and then raising the flag to have someone help you manage what what is truly right sized for what you can do by yourself well I, I just can't thank you enough for getting together again it's been a, it's been a while and it's it's just great catching up and and the stuff that you're doing is amazing and uh, again there will be an act two to this that we have to follow up on because i got many more questions i'm gonna hold you to that okay <laughs> love that okay thanks to you thank you Thank you for joining us today in the shadows for this episode of Health Stealth Radio with Frank Katita. If you like the program, please be sure to share your comments on our social media sites or feel free to contact us with suggestions for new and stealthy show themes. We look forward to welcoming you again for our next broadcast. In the meantime, stay safe out there.